take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19, please. Acts chapter 19. We're going to read the first five verses of Acts 19. We'll read them responsibly. We'll begin together on verse 1, and I'll read 2, and we'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 5 of Acts chapter 19. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture, please. All of us standing to read God's Word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of Acts 19. Ready? And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, <clears throat> passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, <clears throat> he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music today, the uh, wonderful congregational singing and the choir number. Uh, Lord, the beautiful offertory. Thank you so much for the privilege to be in church today. Now, Lord, we're asking you to give us what we need from your word this morning. We ask that you would tune our hearts to yours. We'd, you'd help us to not be distracted in our minds. Uh, to allow the other things to pull our attention away from what you would want to say to us this morning. And so, Lord, help us to listen carefully to the special as it's sung. And, Lord, use the special today to focus our mind and our hearts on you, that we would hear what you would want to say to each one of us this morning. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. <laughs> Our Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you this morning for the Bible. Thank you, God, for 
giving us your word and then preserving your word for us, that we hold copies of your word in our hand. And I pray, God, this morning that we would receive the word, not as the words of a man or the words of men, but as it is in truth, the words of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would have your way in each one of our hearts and lives this morning. Please help me as I bring this message today to say what I ought to say and to leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. But Spirit of God, take what is said and use it in the hearts and lives of people here this morning. Use the message today and use the Word of God in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The Oftentimes you hear people say, well, the most important thing in life is believing. But then you hear somebody say, no, that's not quite right. The most important thing in life is not just believing, but what you believe. And then somebody thinks, says, well, no, maybe that's not quite right. It's, it's not just believing and it's not just what you believe. The most important thing in life is who you believe. That is pretty accurate because the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in the Son of God, you have eternal life, everlasting life. Romans 10 verse 9 said that with the the heart, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, with the heart Man believes unto righteousness. And so we, we believe in Jesus Christ. Who you believe is ultimately important. You see, that means there's two groups of people in the world. Only two. Those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and those who do not. It really always boils down to just two groups. Uh, those, the Bible calls them, those that are saved and those who are lost. If you know Christ as your Savior, you're saved. If you do not know Him as your Savior, the Bible categorizes you as being lost. Now, that determines your eternal destiny. And the most important decision you ever make in life is where will I spend eternity? And and how can I know that when I die I'll go to heaven? Can anybody even know that? Well, the Bible says you certainly can't know. And you only know by placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He died for you. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ died for me. He took my sins on Himself and He was punished on the cross. He took your sins on Himself and was punished on the cross. He died in our place. He took our punishment. All right. When you put your faith in what Christ has done for you, you receive the gift of eternal life. That will determine where you go when you die. If you wait till you die, you waited too late. You will not be able to make your decision at that point. Your decision will have already been made. Now, in Acts 19, if your Bible's open there, you find that Paul... Uh, passing through some upper coast near Ephesus, he found, he found some certain disciples. And he asked them a question in verse number 2. Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now I want you to understand something, and this is a little doctrinal teaching for you. The book of Acts is a transitional book. All right? Uh, leading up to the establishment of the church by Jesus Christ, people were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on people, and then He would leave people. Okay, The Spirit of God came on Samson many times, and he did great wonders, and then the Spirit of God went off of Samson. That's why David would pray in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay? Uh, because the Holy Spirit would come on folks and they would be able to do uh, tremendous feats and tremendous acts for God, and then the Holy Spirit would leave for a while, all right? And so, when now we know when in the New Testament, for instance, in the book of Romans, Paul writes and said, if anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. 
So now we find out there's something that has transitioned here from we get into the church age when Christ is out of the church, and that is when we receive we say we receive Christ as our Savior, then we realize that the person of the Godhead that actually takes up residence in us is God the Holy Spirit. That we receive the Holy Spirit when we get saved. And He indwells. Our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, these folks had believed in Jesus, but they'd not heard anything about the Holy Spirit. They had no idea. So they had only, they had only been heard the gospel prior to Jesus coming. It's much like Apollos, if you remember Apollos. Uh, he was mighty in the scriptures, but knowing only the baptism of John. He only got up to John the Baptist. He wasn't preaching Christ and faith in Jesus Christ. He had only got up to that point, so now Quill and Priscilla took him and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly, and then he began to preach and teach that Jesus was indeed the Christ and bringing people to Jesus and having them be baptized. Now, once they knew uh, that the Holy Spirit is given to them at salvation, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they were baptized in Jesus' name. Now, uh, I, that, that's just a little doctrinal thing for you. What I want to focus this morning for our message is on the question that Paul asked in verse number 2. He said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed O oh, pastor I'm a Christian well let me ask you a question what about since you've been a Christian oh pastor no I, I've been born again what about since you've been born again oh no pastor I've been saved what about since you've been saved what have you done? I'm not asking this morning because I believe by and large uh, most of the people in this room I know and you would make profession of faith that your faith is in Jesus Christ, that you are a believer. Then the question would be that Paul would ask us, what about since you have believed? What has taken place in your life since you believed? So many people think, well, I believe. That's all that matters. Oh no, what about since you believed? What has taken place in your life since then? And, and since you've been born again? In other words, since you believed, have you been baptized? Since you believed, have you followed the Lord in believer's baptism? Look at the book of Acts a little bit earlier in the book of Acts. To Acts chapter 2. Would you look there please? We're going to be in Acts 2 this evening. But I'd like you to look there right now. Acts 2. And look with me at verse Number 40, Peter says this, with, well, the Holy Spirit says, with many other words, did he, that's Peter, <clears throat> testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly, they that gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they heard the word of God. They, they gladly received the message that Peter brought to them about salvation, and immediately upon receiving it about salvation, they were baptized. Now, look over in Acts chapter 8. Would you go to Acts chapter 8? In Acts 8, Philip is told to join himself to a chariot in the desert, and as he joins up to this chariot in the desert, there's a man there from Ethiopia, and he's reading a scroll of the Old Testament, and the scroll of the Old Testament he's reading is Isaiah. And he's reading about the sufferings of Christ. And he asks Philip, who's this man talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And the Bible says, verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let me ask you a question. What comes first, baptism or believing? Believing always comes first. You believe and then you're baptized. 
So he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what happens? He commands the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So it's a simple act of obedience. And you'll find time and time and time again in the New Testament, when someone got saved, they were immediately baptized. They immediately wanted to obey the Lord in baptism. It pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That when you get in the water, you're saying, I believe Christ died, He was buried, and He rose again for me. And you're letting everybody out there see outwardly what you believe in your heart. And it's an outward sign, outward identification of you with Jesus Christ. And that was always, it's just simply an act of obedience. And after you believe, you ought to be baptized. It just goes hand in hand. It goes together. The early church believed that. The eunuch here in Acts 8 believed that. The Philippian jailer a little later on in Acts 16, he and his family got saved in the wee hours of the morning and they all got baptized right away. And uh, so it, it's just been the New Testament practice and it ought to be your practice as well. So if you've been baptized since you believe. Then, back in Acts chapter 2, again, Beginning in verse number 41, I want to ask you this. Are you, since you believed, do you belong and serve in a local church? Do you belong and serve in the local church? Did you notice what it said in verse 41? When they gladly received His word and were baptized, the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Who is them? Yeah, the, the ones who were already there, which was 120 who had gathered in the upper room to pray and wait for the promise of the Father, the endowment of the Spirit of God to preach the gospel. And so now the Lord added to that group of believers, He added to the church. And so when, you're, when you believe in Jesus and then you follow the Lord in baptism, then you belong to a New Testament Baptist church. You belong. You belong to a group that is a called out assembly of believers. That's what the word church literally means. It's a called out assembly. And so you don't become a member of a church because you like everybody. You don't become a member of a church because your mom and dad were members of the church. You don't become a member of the church because they have great activities. You become a member of a church because you've believed and you've been baptized. You believe and you're baptized and then you belong. The Lord adds you to the local church. So when, when you get saved, it's just normal to want to show your gratitude for what the Lord has done for you. Years ago, remember, uh, how many of you remember a show uh, William Shatner was on it? It was called Rescue 911. Remember some of that? Oh, yeah, quite a few remember that thing. They'd reenact different uh, 911 calls. That, that's kind of back in the days when I think when 911 was rather new. And so it was something that everybody, it was a pretty popular show. And they would reenact these rescue uh, that these uh, first responders would, would do. And inevitably, they, then they would have occasionally the actual people involved in it and the actual people who were rescuing them, and they would have them on the set together. And, you know, these people would just express their gratitude to this paramedic or whoever it was that saved their life. And they would inevitably say something like this, I'd do anything for them. I'll be indebted to them for the rest of my life. And I never saw that program, but I thought, isn't that how every Christian should feel towards God, towards Jesus Christ? That because of what He's done for me and what He has saved me from and what He's given me the gift of eternal life and the opportunity of, of a home in heaven, man, I, should, I would be indebted to Him for the rest of my life. What can I do for Him? What can I do to show my gratitude? Well, God said, here's what you do. I'm going to give you a group of believers called a church. And I'm going to allow you to be with those believers and allow you to be able to serve in the local church to show your gratitude to me. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. God says, I'm going to give you a way to express your love for me, and that is, you can get together with others and serve me. If, if Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, 
as the manner of some is. Now, don't think that this idea of having less church is something that's new. It must have been a problem back in the uh, Hebrews day anyway when Paul, I think Paul was the writer of Hebrews when he wrote that to the Hebrew Christians. There were some then who were wanting to forsake the assembling of themselves together. He says, as a manner of some is, he says, but exhorting one another. Exhorting means encouraging each other. You know what you ought to do when you come to church? You ought to be encouraged. Amen. You ought to have some people that you look forward to encouraging. That's why, that's why it's important when you come to church, it's not just for you, though I hope you'll be encouraged, but you come so you can be an encouragement to somebody. You realize that if, well, I just won't go tonight. Yeah, but you know, somebody there might have been looking forward to seeing you. And we're looking forward to get encouragement from you. That they get encouragement when you're here. Ah, nobody knows if I'm there. Oh, yeah, they do. Sure they do. And so you, you don't forsake this something together, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so God says, I, I want you to be faithful to the services of the church. That's why I try to encourage new Christians, new converts. And, and when I look at the crowd and I see people who really grow and really latch on and really catch on to things, it's the ones who got it from the start that I'm going to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I'm going to be there every time the doors are open. And you know, listen, if you would commit to that, you could cancel your therapy session. If you would commit to being in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you could cancel the psychiatrist. You could, you, you could take care of the, the support group. You wouldn't need that anymore. The, those things came into being because people forsook the local assembly. And they have to find something to replace it. Amen, preacher. It's good. Be faithful to church. Get involved doing something for God. Sing in the choir. Sing in the choir. Be faithful when you sing in the choir. Is this on? If you're a choir member, be faithful to sing in the choir. Don't hit or miss. Don't, don't make them think, I don't know if they're going to be here or not. No, 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 no. Sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, you sing in the choir, you be there. Amen. Teach a class. Work on a bus route. Take a turn in the nursery. Clean the building. Do something. You say, I just want to do something for God. Why? I want to show God. I want to show God my appreciation for what He's done for me. Paul said, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. And I, 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 I serve. And Paul said, I do what I do because I love Jesus Christ. Now to be a desire in our heart to want to serve Him and belong to the church. Number three, since you believed, are you studying God's Word? Look at Acts 17 with me, would you please? Acts chapter 17. Paul is driven away here. Paul and Silas driven out of Thessalonica because of persecution. The brethren, verse 10, send them away by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. It says about these Bereans, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They searched the Scriptures daily. And they were checking out what Paul said. Paul would write Timothy... In 2 Timothy 2.15, you know the verse, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm embarrassed at times by the lack of Bible knowledge among Christians. For so many years, we've had advertised and promoted that buy this Bible or buy this new version, it's easier to read and easier to understand and you'll immediately get a grasp of the Bible. Well, I've heard that for 30 years and we have more ignorant Christians now than we ever had before. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Not, not approved unto the pastor, approved unto God. 
How is it that Christians today will tell you who won the Oscar or who's up for an Emmy or who's on Dancing with the Stars, but they can't tell you the books of the Bible? Or they can't tell you the, 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 the four Gospels or they can't uh, tell you who the apostles of Christ were. It doesn't say you study to know yourself. It says study to show thyself approved unto God. Hey, one day we're going to stand before God. How, how are you going to be in heaven when God begins to ask you things about the book He wrote and say, well, you were a Christian for 30 years. Uh, what about this passage over here? And you'll say, man, I never saw that before. What are you going to do when Habakkuk comes up to you and says, what do you think about the book that God had me write? You'll say, you know, your name was a funny name. And that's about all you got. Huh? You see, are we studying to show ourselves approved unto God? I want to know the letter that God has written to me. You grow by the Bible. You will, you will mature by the Bible. Your life will change by the Bible. This is unlike any other book you have at home. Anything else you have is never, it, no other book is promised to transform your life. That, that transformation is, is the, and most of you know, is the word metamorphosis. It's, the, it's, it's where that, that little squiggly, multi legged, ugly little caterpillar gets into a cocoon and then comes out a beautiful two winged butterfly. A complete transformation into something that's crawling on the ground that you'd just as soon step on to something that's beautiful in the air that you'd like to capture and just look at because it's so pretty. God can do that drastic of a change in your life. But He'll use the Word of God to do that. Some of you say, I just don't see anything happening in my life. Tell me how much time you're spending with the Bible. Tell me how much, how much time you're studying the Bible. I know most of the time preachers are just preaching if you just read it. Just try to read some Bible. And we're, we're happy we can get somebody to do just read it. But listen, I, I, we, we ought not to um, sugarcoat the command of God. We ought not to make it less than what God commands. And God commands you to study His Word. God says, you, you, you've heard me say it so many times, you read it so you can study it. You study it so you memorize it. You memorize it so you meditate it. And meditation is what God promises you success. Because it dominates your thoughts. Since you have believed. Oh, I'm saved. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm not asking if you're saved. Since you've been saved. Since you believed. Have you been baptized? Are you serving? Are you studying? Are you separated from the world? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Would you look there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Here Paul is writing the church at Corinth and he tells them in verse number 14, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God is simply saying, here, listen, when you come to know Christ as your Savior, there will be a difference, and there is to be a difference between a saved person and a lost person. There's to be a difference between those who say they're walking in the light and those who are still in darkness. There's an obvious difference between light and dark. There's an, awful, there's an obvious difference between a temple of God and a temple of idols. There's the obvious difference here with righteousness and unrighteousness, with believer and unbeliever. 
And yet, how many would you agree that, that we live in a day when it's getting harder and harder to tell the two apart? Disney has decided with their latest release of Is It Beauty and the Beast that they will have a homosexual scene in it. But I venture to say that won't stop most Christians from watching it. Because they'd rather have their convenience and their entertainment than their convictions. And it's flat out wrong. You need to know the Disney Corporation is not Walt Disney. It's not who they used to be. We look at them as family friendly and family oriented and they are not. They have an agenda. And then you have to be aware of that mom and dad. There's a difference. Attitudes are different. You know, your attitude ought to get different when you get saved. You know, you can be uh, backbiting or angry or critical, but that should change when you get saved. Now you can be compassionate, and you can be caring, and you can be uh, no longer uh, just critical about everything. By the way, your attitudes change, your appearance changes. Appearance changes. Your hair will be different. Your music is different. Your dress is different. It identifies who you belong to. As we, I got to speak this week in the Tuesday night class, and those of you in the Tuesday night class, it was a lesson on the virtuous woman. And it's interesting how when it comes to the virtuous woman, uh, the Bible addresses the woman, often in the Bible addresses the woman's appearance. But he always connects the woman's appearance with the woman's heart. Because the way that you look is a matter of your heart. In the Old Testament, in Proverbs chapter 7, when it describes the woman who's dressed in the attire of a harlot. In other words, listen, you, you, you look and you make the determination, you make the judgment, that woman's a harlot by what she is wearing. They had the attire of a harlot. But you know what the next phrase is right after they said that? She has the attire of a harlot, subtle of heart. He immediately told us what was in her heart. Because, ladies, a virtuous woman doesn't argue with God in her heart about what she's supposed to wear, about how she's supposed to dress to honor God. Paul told Timothy, you're to, you're to adorn, women are adorn themselves as women professing godliness. And when God reveals to you how you ought to dress as a woman professing godliness, there's no argument in the virtuous woman's heart. If God said it, I want to do it. If that's what God wants, that's what I want. That shows when, when you rebel against being separate in the way you dress, you're rebelling it shows a rebellious heart. It's not about the clothing. It's about your heart. See, you just want your way and not God's way. Boy, that's quiet in here, isn't it? Hmm? Are, you here to, am, I, are we here to please ourselves? And that's really what it comes down to when it comes to being separate. We're, we're saying, well, I don't see what's so wrong. Well, I, I think this is okay. I don't know what's so bad. And we're, we're using all our reasoning instead of just saying, God, I want to please you. Lord, I want to please you. And, and I want to be different. Notice what the Lord said. Listen, look at the promise that He gives you. If we come out from among them and be ye separate, verse 17, saith the Lord, we touch not the unclean thing, he says, I will receive you. That, that word receive means I'll embrace you. I'll embrace you. And notice he says, I'll be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You say, you mean God's not going to be my father? No, he can't function as a father with you because you're rebellious. 
You can't have the same relationship with you that he can a child that's obedient. When your children, if, if, they're, if you have one child that is disobedient, you have to discipline them and you send them to their room or you sit them in a chair for a certain period of time. You have another child that has obeyed you and done things with you. You know what you do? You do things with them and that other child sits there. What, are you not their mom and dad? Sure I am. But I can't be their mother and father right now because they've been disobedient. I can't function that way. You see? until they decide they want to obey. Then I can embrace them. And I can be, I can function as a father to them and as a mother to them. Some of you have grown children. And you have grown children, some that, uh, that, that want to please God and still want to honor you. And you can function as a mother and father with them. But you also have a prodigal. You have a wayward son or a wayward daughter. They don't want to honor you. They don't really don't want anything to do with you. And you know what? You're still their father. You're still their mother. But you can't be a father or mother to them. They won't let you. Because they've chosen to go away from you. You see? Oh, you'd love to embrace them. The father of the prodigal son didn't run and embrace him until the son came home. Once the son came home, now I can embrace him. And I can be a father to you. When he was out sitting in the pig slop, he couldn't be a father. He was his father, but he couldn't be a father to him. Not till he came home. Come out and be separate, saith the Lord. There's such, listen, there's great blessing in being separate from the world and being separated unto God. Have you done that since you believed? Are you baptized? Are you serving? Are you studying? Are you separating? Since you believed, are you seeking the lost? Are you seeking the lost? Acts 20 and verse number 24. Acts 20 and verse 24. <clears throat> Paul said, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received with the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, I just want to testify of the gospel I want to tell other people about Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning, church. Is there a hell? There is a place that when people die without Jesus Christ, they'll go there to suffer and be tormented forever and ever and ever. Do we really do you believe that? If you really believe that, who did you try to keep from going there this week? How can we say we believe that and never try to get somebody, stop somebody from going there in a seven-day period? If that be true, and there is a hell, then certainly that ought to be a top priority for us to keep people from going there. And that's why, I, 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 listen, that's really why we're still here. God is, God is holding off coming back for us because He's not willing any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How are they, coming, how are they ever going to come to repentance? They can't believe on Him who they not heard, and they can't hear without a preacher. That's us. We have to get the gospel to them. You say, well, and, and by the way, we're here to glorify God, but I'm going to honest with you, we can glorify God when we get to heaven. We can bring honor to Him when we get to heaven. We can sing praises to Him when we get to heaven. We can praise His name there. But I tell you what we can't do there. We can't tell anybody else about Jesus. We can't keep anybody out of hell once we go to heaven. So you're here, and I'm here, to get the message out. To tell folks about Christ. To try to keep them from going to hell. In John 1, when Andrew followed Jesus, being one of John's disciples, the first thing the Bible says, you read about it, he first findeth his own brother, Simon Peter. Man, Andrew's first thought was, boy, I'm saved. Man, i got to go tell Peter about this. I tell you what, you read the New Testament, you ought to be very glad he told Peter about it. Peter had plays a great part in the New Testament. Why? Because his brother Andrew led him to Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Peter did much greater things than Andrew did. 
But Peter, but Andrew had the burden. Get the gospel to the lost. That's why, that's why there's a church. That's why that there's a bus ministry. That's why there's a children's church. That's why there's an RU program. That's why there's a country fair. That's why there's a dinner day. That's our number one job is we're trying to get the gospel to the lost. We're trying to tell them about Christ that the only way is through Him. The church's job is not to shut down the abortion clinic. The church's job is not to close down the adult bookstore. The church's job is not to keep the environment clean. The church's job is to proclaim the gospel and do our best to keep people out of hell. And we've lost our mission. We've lost our focus. Somebody comes to church and we're saying, not, not what are you doing to get the gospel out? What are you doing to save the lost? What are you doing to reach the community? It's, it's what do you have for me? What kind of coffee do you serve on Sundays? What kind of donuts do you have? What kind of activities do you have for my children? What kind of sports programs does the church run? You see how far off we've got? Well, don't you have exercise classes? That's what, that's what gets asked about churches. And, and churches have great, great buildings and great empires and all kinds of properties and such. And, and you find out that they have, Brother Morton, they support maybe five missionaries. Oh, but we have, you know, 55 in our, you know, Overeaters Anonymous class. We have all kinds of things going on in our church that, listen, that, that don't matter with getting the gospel to the lost. We have to get back to seeking the lost. Hey, that's not just, and when I say it's the church's responsibility, that's all of us individually. It's our responsibility. We ought to be, we ought to be heading out of this place on a Sunday and all through the week. There ought to be gospel tracts given out and invitations given out and the gospel given and witnessing being done all across this area by people in this room right here. Take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. Since you believed, have you been baptized? Do you belong and are you serving in a local church? Have you, are you studying the scriptures? Are you separating from the world? Are you seeking the lost? And number six, since you believed, have you yielded to the Spirit of God? Have you yielded to the Spirit of God? We mentioned earlier, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your body. You get, now, it's automatic. When you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. He lives in you if you receive Christ as your Savior. And you have, you have all of the Holy Spirit you'll ever have. The question I'm asking is, does He have all of you? Have you yielded to Him? You see, the Spirit of God indwells us, but it's not a hostile takeover. He will not take over unless you yield to Him. You have to surrender. He won't grab the wheel from you. You have to let your hands off and say, I want you to control. There's, there's a yielding. There's, the Bible calls it being filled with the Spirit. To where you're not, uh, that's why it always, it likened to being filled with the Spirit to being drunk with wine. When someone is drunk, we say they're under the influence of something else, of another substance. Are you under the influence of another person? The Holy Spirit of God? Hmm? And allowing Him to control your actions? And when I hear people say, well, I could never do that. Well, what's the Holy Spirit for? Why is He there? Or the great thing is when Christians say, well, I'm not comfortable doing that. You know what the Holy Spirit's called? The Comforter. Maybe, maybe God knew you wouldn't be comfortable and so He gave you a Comforter to help you to do what He wants you to do. God... God never intended for you and me to, to live these, this Christian life since we believe. He never intended us to do it in our power, in our strength. Somebody says, well, I'm just going to try harder. No, you need to trust more. You need to trust harder. 
not try harder. You'll never ever succeed trying to do it yourself. Struggle, burden, defeat, discouragement comes to your Christian life when you're trying to do it yourself. Say, Spirit of God, I need your help. I yield to you. I yield my members as servants of righteousness. Please control me today. Help me to do what God wants me to do. Give me your strength and let me do it in your power, not my power. And watch the Holy Spirit of God work. He'll help you. But you must yield to Him. How many Christians go through their Christian life and never ask the Holy Spirit to help them at all. What a tragedy. That's why James told us the spirit that dwells in us lusteth to envy. Lust is just a strong desire. He has a strong desire in us to the point of envy. And I think he's envious when he sees Other things and other people have influence over us and we won't let Him have influence over us. He desires to control us like we so easily let other things control us. Yield to the Spirit's control. It was Gandhi of India who said, I would have become a Christian if it had not been for Christians. I would have become a Christian if it had not been for Christians. The problem, the problem isn't believing in Christ. The problem is, what about since you believed? Since you believed. What have you done since you believed? What have you allowed God to do in your life since you believed? Baptized? Serving, studying, separating, seeking the lost, submitting to the Spirit of God. Since ye believed. Heavenly Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you for a great salvation that you provided that we can have by believing simply placing our faith in what Jesus has done for us, receiving your gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Thank you. And Lord, my prayer would be if anyone in the room has never believed on Christ, that they'd believe on Him as their Savior today. But the purpose of the message today is what the Apostle Paul asked these Christians What about since you believed? The message today is to these believers in this room about since they believed. And I pray that you've spoken to hearts this morning. And I pray that decisions will be made for you today. People will understand that it really does matter what I've done since I believed that God has begun a good work in me and He will perform it until the day of Christ. Lord, teach us that that, that it's You that's working in us both to will and to do of Your good pleasure. I pray that we would be serving, that we would be separating, we'd be studying the Word of God, to show ourselves approved unto you. We'd be seeking the lost. We have the reality that people die without Christ and they'll go to hell. But Lord, we would be submissive to your spirit. We would live the Christian life not in our power, but in your power, your strength. Speak to hearts today as only you can. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, you talked about believing in Jesus. And there's a time in my life when I 
believed on Christ and I ask Him to be my Savior. And that this morning I'm trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for me as my hope for heaven. And so, Pastor, on that basis, I know the Bible, that according to the Bible, if I die, I'll go to heaven because I'm trusting Jesus alone as my Savior. If that's your case, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. That's my hand as a testimony. God bless you. You may put them down. If you're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I appreciate you praying for me. I'd like to know that for sure. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me today? I didn't think I saw anybody's hand that didn't go up the first time. So the message was to believers. What about since ye believed? I wonder how many believers here this morning could say, Preacher, the Spirit of God has spoken to my heart. There's some things that you've touched on this morning that I know God wants to do in my life since I believe. The Spirit of God has dealt with me today. Pastor, please pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me. Amen. Amen. God bless you. That's great. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray. We're going to have our invitation. Whatever it is, if, it's, if you need baptism, come and say, Preacher, I'm saved. I've never been baptized. I want to take care of that. Is it belonging and serving in a local church? Come and say, I want to belong. I want to serve in the local church. Is it separating from the world? You need to come and pray and bow the knee and say, God, whatever you want. I'll not be rebellious in my heart. I want to be separate to you. I want you to embrace me. I want you to be able to be a father unto me. Is it seeking the lost? Is it time you grab some tracks on the way out the door and say, God, I'm ready to begin to witness for you again? I need to tell others of Christ. If I really believe people are going to hell, why am, why am I not doing anything to keep people from going there? Are you yielded to the Spirit? Maybe I ought to just bow the knee and say, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I can't do it. I get weary, I get tired, I get frustrated. Spirit of God, I need you. Empower me. Whatever it is that the Lord has touched your heart about, I want you to obey him this morning. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray your will be done now these next few moments of invitation. May holy decisions be made for you this morning that will affect our lives for time and for eternity. Have your way now in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart this morning. Respond to him now, will you please? Oh, to be like <clears throat> thee, That's right. blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of us treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, Oh, to be like Thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as Thou art. Come in Thy sweetness, come in Thy fullness, stamp Thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like Thee, full of compassion, Loving, forgiving, tender and kind. Helping the helpless, cheering the fainting. Seeking the wandering sinners to find. Oh, to be like Thee, oh, to be like Thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as a art. Come in thy fullness, come in thy sweetness, taste thy own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring, 
cruel reproaches, willing to suffer others to save. Oh, to be like Thee, oh, to be like Thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as Thou art. Come in Thy sweetness, come in Thy fullness, stamp Thine own image deep in my heart. Look this way for a minute. You know, you have to understand something. I I grew up in Bible-believing Baptist churches. I remember it always stood out to me as a boy. One of the differences that I had people, I went to public school, and I knew people that were Catholic, the Catholic faith. How many of you were Catholic before you got saved? Okay, several of you. <coughs> And it used to always, it, it never made any sense to me that it seemed to me like Catholics would just, you know, go go to Mass or go to confession and they just did whatever they wanted the rest of the week anyway and then go confess it and then go back out and do whatever you wanted to live any way you wanted to live anyhow. And and I knew that where, what, where I was and what I was hearing was not that, that what were to live differently. But I'm fearful that that's exactly what I see in most Christian churches today. Is we come and go through the ritual of say, well, I went to church today, and then it doesn't affect our life the rest of the week whatsoever. We listen to whatever we want to listen to. We go wherever we want to go. We look whatever we want to look like. And it has no effect on us whatsoever until next Sunday we go to church. And we become Baptist Catholics if you don't understand what I mean by that term. And I'm not trying to, do, please don't, you know, don't get mad and say, oh, he's preaching against Catholics. But listen, uh, I, I just think we're seeing in Christianity something that, that isn't good. Since she believed, uh, we're saved for a purpose. And uh, let's, let's ask God to, 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 to let the world see a difference in our life. But that, that's not just when we're in here on a Sunday when we're out there the rest of the week. Amen? Let's ask the Lord to help us, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, everyone's attention today. Lord, we, we want to walk out the doors today and realize that we're different than when we came in this morning. And Lord, that we want to be what you want us to be. We're just saying that we want you to stamp your own image deep on our heart. Lord, we pray that that would not just be a song we're singing, but a prayer we're making. And we realize that'll make a difference in how we live every day of the week. May others see Christ in us. May we yield ourselves to you. Give us a good Sunday and a good Sunday afternoon. Bring us back this evening for the evening service. And we'll thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.